はいはい。
Microphone, please. Okay, is that better? Right, apologies, apologies to those online who didn't hear the opening. You can see the words on the slide, I'm not going to repeat them. But the question is, if there is some kind of basis in our biology that suggests that access to the natural environment is important, what does this mean for us in an increasingly urbanized society? And you all know that over 50% of the world is urbanized, we're all getting older, we're all getting more urbanized, so what does it mean? And one of the things that we can understand if we look through history at urban people's engagement with the landscape, they have always wanted to have gardens or parks or green spaces engagement with nature even in the urban environment. So 1400s before the common era, in Thebes, in Egypt, we see these gardens next to the urban developments of the Nile. Beautiful gardens, you can make out the date palms and other beautiful uh, plants within the landscape. Um, the, I'm sorry, the, the reformatting of the slides here, it's kind of the text has disappeared, which is frustrating. This is um, actually a Mughal illustration of the Persian four square garden. And one of the things that is interesting about many ancient creation myths is the link between paradise and a garden. And in fact, the Farsi word for garden is paradise. Medieval courtyards in uh, Europe that were um, cloisters that had gardens in that led you into a cathedral or a church were also called paradises. So the four square garden, the beautiful watered garden of paradise. Um, ancient Rome. People understood that in the busy urban cities of Rome and ancient Rome introduced a lot of urban living, um, the need to get to the countryside was important. Here's Pliny the Younger talking about getting away from the busyness of town and interestingly talking about he had a choice of a villa outside Rome or in Tuscany. The one in Tuscany was better for his health of body and mind, getting into the countryside. Now, most urban dwellers don't have necessarily easy access to the wider countryside on a daily or weekly basis. So Marshall talked about the value of Rus in Urbe, the countryside in the town. So even in ancient Rome, the value of urban parks was recognized as important for well-being. And wall paintings from that era remind us of what people were talking about, the delights of nature. We look at Moorish gardens in the Iberian Peninsula, some of the most beautiful gardens developed um, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, and these are again beautiful courtyard gardens, a paradise garden within the urban environment. Yes, for the privileged, but still recognized as important. Monastic gardens, cloister garden, a version of the Kelly-style garden, again and again, these beautiful places are produced in urban societies. But also, of course, monastic gardens were considered very important as hospital gardens. And the herbs that were grown there were usually grown for medicinal purposes. So they've got a combination of a place for spiritual contemplation, but also physical productivity good for our health. Um, and the top line there says the 18th century English landscape gardens. Um, writers like Burke were comparing in the 18th century those paintings such as the one on the left I mentioned at the start uh, that represented the beautiful in the landscape. Lots of discussion, lots of theories about it. And the um, image on the right is by Salvatore Rosa as opposed to Poussin on the left. And that is of an alpine landscape. When the English gentleman went on his grand tour of Europe, it's taken several years to see the sites in the 18th century, to go to Italy, of course, he would have to go through the Alps and they would experience a very different kind of dramatic landscape that induced awe and terror. It was a bit of a thrill about it as well. But this was considered a sublime landscape. So we have the languor of beauty, the gentleness, the elegance of beauty contrasted with a rather terrific and dramatic, awful horror of sublimity. And Studley Royal landscape in England, many English landscapes were developed based on the theories of the beautiful. Here's Studley Royal with the beautiful line of grace, that S-shaped river curve echoing Hogarth's line of beauty. Studley Royal again, a neoclassical building set in a well-treed uh, landscape, that combination very common in the 18th century. That's the beautiful. And here we have, by contrast, the sublime. This is actually Yosemite. Some of you will recognize in North America. But um, 
you can imagine a, an alpine landscape of sorts, very different. This is not beautiful in that same sense. This is sublime landscape, very dramatic. And what happened in the English landscape garden tradition was that people discussed the pros and cons and picturesque landscapes were proposed as a compromise to the best of all possible worlds between the beautiful and the sublime. Picturesque landscapes, this is an example by Humphrey Repton actually up in Scotland, north of Edinburgh. Picturesque landscapes would correct the languor of beauty, too lazy, too dull, too predictable, and the horror of sublimity. The picturesque would be somewhere interesting in between the two. And the picturesque, interestingly, would have mental as well as physical benefits. Excite the active curiosity which gives play to the mind. I'll come back to that later. Redeeming the effects of the sublime by loosening the iron bonds with which astonishment chains up its faculties. This is Uvdel Price, a promoter of, of the picturesque. So the idea that these landscapes have mental uh, associations, psychological benefits, not just physical benefits, is very much wrapped up in this 18th century articulation of the virtues of engagement with nature. And then you're probably very much aware that the parks movement uh, in Britain and elsewhere in Europe was very much a response to health and the health of the working classes who were flooding into towns during the Industrial Revolution, also a concern about cholera and other communicable diseases, but quotes here underline how parks were seen as one way to maintain a healthy working population. And a park in the East End of London, uh, Victoria Park is where the Olympics Park was subsequently developed very recently. And the idea here is very clearly that the formation of the park will benefit people's health. Picturesque parks were the <coughs> aesthetic which was used to develop these parks in the 19th century. Joseph Paxton, who developed private parks, private gardens as well as public parks, developed Birkenhead, one of the first publicly commissioned, publicly owned parks constructed outside Liverpool in England, was designed in a picturesque style to give this physical and psychological benefit to the working class. And these images of Birkenhead Park recently regenerated very much in the picturesque mode. That slightly rugged landscape is very much in the picturesque mode. And um, you can see here this quote, public parks might be the only places where the pale mechanic and the exhausted factory operative might inhale the freshening breeze in some portion of recovered health. So they are very much seen as places that offer health to the urban residents. And even uh, royal parks, which in Britain, in London, for example, royal parks had been exclusive parks of privilege for the aristocratic and royal groups only. They became public parks, they became accessible to the public and started to be advertised as places that people visiting London would like to uh, see from abroad. So here's um, a park in London being promoted, St. James's Park, in a very picturesque sort of image for visitors from abroad. This was promoted to the French. And then, I'm sorry, but all the words seem to be chopped off at the top. Oh, no, they're not chopped off for you. They're just chopped off for me. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted in North America, working with a, an English architect, Calvert Vox, developed perhaps the most famous urban park in, in North America, Central Park in New York City, but also what's considered the most beautiful park, Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And again, this was very much influenced by ideas of the picturesque. And Olmsted had visited Birkenhead Park in Liverpool. He had visited London parks. He had visited Bois de Boulogne and other places in Europe as well. So this was very much an, a pastoral, a sort of artificial, picturesque, pastoral aesthetic taken from English landscape ideals. And again, here's Olmsted talking about what's a park going to do for the urban dweller in North America. He describes this, the artificial conditions of a town will produce a harmful effect first on a man's entire mental and nervous system and ultimately on his entire constitutional organization. Even then, they reckoned urban living wasn't necessarily always a good thing in all dimensions. Overexposure to artificial sites of a city, this, this sounds like it describes me, excessive nervous tension, over-anxiety, hasteful disposition, impatience and irritability. The antidote is pleasing rural scenery. And what Olmsted and his collaborators, Calvert Vox and others, were trying to do was to produce 
a, a landscape that was very much in contrast to the rigid gridiron urban environment. And when we look at theories today about what links landscape and health, and there are many of them, many interesting ones, and Francesca and I have actually both been involved in a report which we hope will come out very soon on links between urban green space and health. But attention restoration is one theory that was very interestingly developed initially by a landscape uh, em environmental psychologists at the University of Michigan, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan. And um, they describe in 20th century, late 20th century language, something that is very similar to what Olmsted was talking about in the 19th century. You know, Olmsted talks about leading visitors away from the mental contemplation of objects associated with conditions which have produced strain or fatigue. And the Kaplans talk about cluttered, confusing environments are central to what is experienced as mental fatigue. Negotiating the busy street, all those people you have to pass, the traffic, the what's going on. And actually, it turns out staring at computer screens also does this to us. And many of us spend much of our lives staring at computer screens. And we get um, fatigued. The, res the um, directed attention gets exhausted. And we need to relieve that if we're to work effectively. It's, it is a fact. It's been demonstrated experimentally. But what's interesting is that the natural environment, surprise, surprise, turns out to have a special relationship to each of the four factors that these environmental psychologists identified as being really important to create a restorative environment, one that restores people and allows them to use their directed attention again effectively. And this has been shown in experimental conditions in relation to people producing work. And one of those four things, being away, extent, fascination, compatibility, Fascination is an interesting one here. We talk nowadays about soft fascination. There's something about the natural environment, the fluttering of leaves in the wind, waves on water, the, the um, pattern of light coming through trees onto the ground. Those are things which completely engage us. We can look at them very easily in a relaxed kind of way. They engage us, they fascinate us, but we don't have to work to attend to them. It's that soft fascination. And this is what's called attention restoration, uh, a quality soft fascination. So that links up with, I'm going to finish here, the potential mechanisms that more recently we've been researching, and my own research center has been involved in some, looking at circadian rhythms, um, circadian patterns of uh, salivary cortisol in work we did with deprived urban populations in uh, Scotland. Uh, people not in work, we could predict healthier diurnal cortisol patterns from how much green space they had around their home environment. So physiological measures, measures are now starting to sort of reinforce some of these theories perhaps that uh, were developed much earlier on. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Happy to answer questions afterwards. Okay, so I will be talking about climate change and human health. I must admit this is like not a very comfortable position, but, uh, but I have my handout, so I'll manage. Um, this presentation was originally supposed to be done by my colleague, Sara, but unfortunately she couldn't make it today and I'm replacing her. But I hope I cover everything that she wanted to talk about. So I'll first talk about climate change and human health, how we see climate change affecting human health in general. Then we'll talk about the technologies for climate change adaptation in the health sector. And finally, we'll share a little bit of our experiences from technology needs assessment project, which both Sarah and I have been involved in. But uh, before I uh, move on to my presentation, since relatively we are an unknown agency in the building, uh, I thought I'll just give a brief introduction about the kind of work that we do. So we are the UNEP DTU partnership. We are an integral part of the Technical University of Denmark based out of Lungby. Um, so the department is the Department of Management Engineering. Our, our management po uh, policy committee comprises of DANIDA, which is the Danish International Aid Agency. It is comprising of, um, of UNEP as well as DTU. So apart from the experts we have uh, at UNEP DTU here in the UN city, we also have access to a lot of experts from the university as such. 
and we are from again very different nationality, something very similar to uh, the UN system that we have over here. Um, we have four uh, specialized uh, areas where we work on. I'm from the Climate Resilient Development, uh, which works on, among other things, on capacity building for incorporating climate change adaptation into development policies. Then we also have the clean energy development, which is a go into technologies for, um, uh, for clean energy. Then we have the low carbon development, and we also have the Copenhagen Center for Energy Efficiency, which is, um, um, which is supporting the sustainable energy for all initiative of the United Nations. So our mandate generally is to support all um, the UNEP activities in uh, sustainable development and climate change and in energy. So yeah, that's like a small summary of uh, the kind of things that we do. Now I come to the more difficult job of summing up climate change and health in just a few minutes, uh, and I've been told to to stick to the timeline. So, but let's hope we can we can cover the important points. So, why is this climate change? Um, I'm sure I tried to be a little bit more elementary in my approach. Why is this um, suddenly become so important in our lives? Climate change was not heard of 25 years ago, and suddenly it has become so important in our lives. And it's primarily because of all the emissions that we have sent up in the atmosphere after the industrial revolution. Uh, the earth, from the time it was formed, it has its climate has been changing. But this is the natural variability of climate. And as human beings and through our anthropogenic activities, we have accelerated this place, uh, the space of climate change, which you can also see um, in the image on your right bottom, where you can see that there is a natural variability of climate and over and above that our anthropogenic activities have accelerated this space. But still, like if I look at the last century, say from 1905 to 2005, the global rise in temperature is in the range of say 0.6 degrees Celsius to 0.9 degrees Celsius. Now, If I look at it in very rudimentary terms, how does a one degree change in temperature affect me? Is it really important I can survive one degree? But the problem is not in one degree. We don't experience one degree change every moment. We experience it in extremes. And if you have a look at the picture on the bottom, uh, which is the simplistic description of, um, of temperature extremes. So in the last 100 years, I would say like more than 100 years, if you have to count it from the Industrial Revolution, um, what has happened is that our averages have increased. So yes, we do see a 0.9 degree rise in global temperature, but the point is that it has also shifted a little bit. So we have fat tails in that distribution and we have more of extremes. So how does it really affect us? Yesterday, Catherine and I were discussing that, okay, the problem is not in rainfall average being increased. The problem is when this rainfall comes in just one hour. And just imagine how our systems are incapable of dealing with it. We have our set um, infrastructure, we have our drainage systems, but can it deal with an extreme amount of rainfall in one hour? No, it cannot. And then of course it has a bearing on, on health issues if your drainage system cannot uh, deal with it and there is all sewerage around. And in fact, um, Dr. Professor Catherine added it one very nice example, how the landscapes have changed in, in, in the last um, few years. We used to have uh, natural sinks of water in our urban settlements which have been covered by concrete. We used to have gardens in our backyard. Now they have been made into parking lots. So this whole idea of letting the water go out from the cities has basically, um, you know, it's changing now. We want the water to percolate right there because our systems cannot absorb that much water in that small amount of time. So again, this has like a lot of health bearing. The European heat wave of 2003, our systems were not designed for the for that strong heat wave. It was a heat wave which uh, was perhaps in 500 years, was one of the worst heat waves of Europe. So the change in climate essentially translates into changes in the geophysical environment. And if you have to boil it down to three indicators, it will be in changes in precipitation, it will be changes in temperature, it will be changes in sea level. And, and finally, it is the extreme events, which could be in cyclones and other events. And then it kind of modifies our biophysical environment in terms of um, our water resources, our biodiversity in forests, and then finally, at the third order, we can say that we have droughts, we have um, you know health issues, more um, more more aeroallergens, uh, then there are more vector-borne diseases and all that. So it kind of 
Of course, uh, this is like a very simplistic view of how climate change is affecting us because even rise in temperatures is, has a very strong bearing on, on the human health. So this is in summary of uh, how climate change is affecting us. Um, let me, um, as I mentioned, that the problem is of extremes and how these extremes are changing in future also affects our planning right now. So I would just like to show uh, one slide from the uh, IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is from the recent IPCC uh, report, the assessment report five. And if you see, uh, for example, if you see the first line over here, it says higher maximum temperatures and more hot days. From the first, uh, the, from the first time we had these projections in the third assessment report in 2001, look at the confidence level that we have now. It is changing from likely to very likely. So that's basically an increase of almost 60% in your confidence level when you move to 2011 in the special report on extreme events. And again, look at also even the temporal, uh, the, the spatial effects like from in general, uh, in overall landmass areas, it becomes like, yes, on, on a global scale, we'll experience more extreme events. And of course, towards the end of the century, we are like virtually certain that this is supposed to happen. So how is it actually affecting our health systems? And I thought, let me just give a brief overview of how it is affecting our health. And please feel free to add, you are the experts in health. Um, extreme temperatures, European heat wave, so it's not really confined to developing countries, it's just everywhere. Um, then we have increased arrow allergens. Uh, it's causing respiratory disorders in the US itself, like the pollen season has increased from 11 to 27 days uh, in the last 15 years because of climate change. Vector ecology changes. Um, I remember we worked on, um, on a project in Colombia and it's not just human health, it's like also the financial and economic effects of human health which bothers people. So in the hydrocarbon industry in Colombia, which is also state owned, um, we were interacting with some officials there and they said, look, one of our biggest climate change problem is that our workers in the field, they catch chicken gunia, which was not a problem some time back. And then they're off from work for so long. So it affects. There are, of course, uh, in the recent years, we have also seen degradation of environment in general, mass migration. In fact, some estimates say that from 2008, it's over 20 million people who have migrated just because of, uh, you know, these environment related disasters. I'm not including earthquakes and tsunamis, it's just more of weather related events. So that's a lot of people, it's probably boils down to one person per second actually. Then we have food supply. Uh, food supply is like, you need more irrigation, you need more water for agriculture. So it's not just one human health sector, it's also a lot of allied sectors which are affecting human health. So these allied sectors are first affected by climate change and then it affects your health. Water quality, my colleague Sarah, who didn't come today, she's worked extensively in Tanzania and one of her uh, researchers in cholera in Tanzania, she estimated that in fact, because of climate change, if there is a one degree rise, it can actually increase the susceptibility of cholera from 23 to 46% increase, it's just significant. And if you kind of boil down to the cost that it means for the government, it will be around uh, it could range anywhere from 1.5% to 7% of the GDP just for cholera. That's significant. In the same way, we have like air quality issues. It's not just air quality outside, but even indoor air quality is being affected by climate change. And then, of course, we have extreme events, hurricanes, etc., which are directly affecting fatalities and mortality rates. So this was in summary of how it is affecting us. And because it's not just, uh, you know, the specific vulnerable group, it's spread across the world, it is spread across population. Of course, we have more, uh, you know, very important vulnerable groups that we need to take care of. Uh, we really cannot design foolproof systems for, for uh, dealing with climate change, not just in the health sector, but also in agriculture, also in water, also in forestry. And therefore, we really have to move towards actively incorporating climate change adaptation uh, into our policy planning. So I just kind of thought, okay, what kind of adaptive practices you can have? You can have something that prepares you um, in advance. So 
for health, it may be relevant, for example, having vaccines, access to healthcare is something that is very important in a developing country context. You need more specialized infrastructure. It could be dikes for prevention from, um, from seawater. It could be more of mangrove plantations on the coast, etc. Similarly, this was like the pre-planning phase, something that you would want to prepare on. The next is like if you foresee something is about to happen, then how do you deal with it? And it's more on the response capacity. And it could have, it could be early warning systems for health. In fact, um, in, in our projects, early warning systems for health has emerged as one of the top technologies in, in, in the healthcare sector. And finally, it also is very important to look into what are the vulnerable sectors? How do you map them? A lot of times, especially in developing countries, they don't know which areas are more vulnerable to what. So it's it's important to plan it out and in, in for having like right response plans, you should have uh, a maps of vulnerabilities, a clear idea of what is your vulnerable population. And finally, you need an overall um, overall mechanism to manage these through policies, um, through more planning and monitoring and evaluation. So I'll, um, I, I mean, I'll actually now talk about some of our experiences from the technology needs assessment project. So this project was supported by Jeff, and in our first phase, we supported around 36 uh, developing countries. The second phase is going on where we have 25 countries. Um, so here, uh, our objective was to support um, countries in a, in a country-driven process through capacity building so that they can prioritize essential technologies in their countries and then um, go ahead and plan some action plans by identifying barriers and how they can overcome those barriers for implementing these technologies. So how we understand technology is not just one piece of equipment like this, that this is a technology, but every technology also has an aspect of software, it has an aspect of orgware to technology. I'll just give you some examples over here. So for example, solar home systems is, is a hardware technology, but it will also have you know, a software component and an orgware component to it. Of course, we make also a distinction here that uh, a technology is different from a means of implementation. And often, say for example, if you have a water union association, these are like some of the gray areas where we don't know whether you would want to qualify it as a technology or as a mean of implementation. But essentially, how we try and visualize is that any form of knowledge is also technology. But if it's dissemination of knowledge or if it's more of capacity building, then it's a process and not really a technology. So in this slide, I would like to share some experiences from um, Moldova, a European country which I thought may be more relevant to present their experiences. Um, so there, uh, again here, even in Moldova, one country which suffered a lot during the European heat wave of 2003. Uh, so this is like an outcome of their prioritization criteria. So if you see the social criteria has a weight of almost 33%. So you want the health technologies, what you want to implement to take care of the health, but also do well on the social fronts, like it could be gender, it could be protection of the most vulnerable groups. And it's, it was a very interesting revelation for us that, okay, countries do want technologies to take care of health, but they should do well on the social aspect as well. It was similar in case of Sri Lanka, where the social aspect weighed almost 50%. So that was, that was an important learning for us. Um, moving on, I thought, let me just compile what are the common barriers, because these are technologies, especially like early warning systems, having like more facilities in the healthcare system. Uh, some of the common things that you want to be implemented, but they have not disseminated enough. And the barriers are like common across countries. So, and of course, there are barriers in economic and financial barriers where you, uh, you know, basically there are no funds to execute them. But some interesting things that came out was network failures. So they say that, okay, we have one department working on something and we have another department working on something and there is no flow of information. And this is something that really needs to be addressed. So there's one department working on something and you kind of replicate it or you are kind of outsourcing this information which somebody already has it. So it doesn't really work well. And of course, there are a lot of um, you know, capacity uh, deficiencies in terms of human skills, in terms of institutional and organizational capacities, which countries really need to work on to have a very robust health system. And um, one important factor that came in the social and cultural aspects was that 
people who will be adopting the technologies who don't have faith in the technologies. Yeah. And it is something that has to be worked out in consultation with all other stakeholders as well. So this was an overview of, uh, of the barriers. And uh, from a policymaker's perspective, I think the first important thing is to acknowledge that there is a problem in public health. And this problem is becoming manifold because of climate change. So it's also important from, um, you know, for WHO, I think, who are actively involved in health activities that this problem is just becoming complicated. So you have something in vision right now, but the same problems may not be there down five years down the line, and they could be like different kind of vector borne diseases or something. So I think the first first thing is to acknowledge, and the good part is that in, in the Paris Agreement, where countries presented their intended nationally determined contributions, a lot of countries have acknowledged health as a priority sector where they need to adapt, to name a few, Malaysia, Sudan. So it's not just confined to LDCs, but it's also um, you know, the developing world which has acknowledged that health is a problem and we would really like to adapt here. In the TNAs, of course, uh, our technology needs assessment project, again, we had some countries which, um, which prioritized health as a sector. And because it's not just health, it's also like, if you see agriculture and water, which are directly have a bearing on the health sector, you can probably practically see it everywhere in all the countries. So, so yes, so I think the first step is to acknowledge. The next step is that decisions have to be made in an uncertain environment. You don't know whether there will be a one degree rise or there will be a two degree rise and how it will actually translate into actual effects. So the policy makers have to acknowledge this, that you know this is an uncertain environment that we are operating in and we have to do the best in this. The next is that we have to mainstream health technologies, not just with a health specific focus, but also in all other sectors. And finally, it's also important to overcome the social and economic barriers. Like if you have an evacuation plan in place and the farmer at the coast says, no, I don't want to leave my cows. I'm sorry, I cannot move to your storm shelters. How do you deal with that? So these are some social cultural aspects that have to be taken care of in policy planning. So it cannot go in an independent silo. Look at how cultural aspects matter to these implementation of these technologies. And therefore, it is also important to engage with stakeholders. Uh, we also have a project called Admire, and I have my colleague Kaline over here who's working on um, Admire project, which is, uh, which is kind of dealing with the private sector and making out bankable projects and engagement with private sector. And this is something which is very important for adaptation, I think, to have more engagement from the, ca uh, from the private sector. Um, you know, this is something, uh, a potential which is not tapped so much. So yes, um, I think this is something very important and we also are working on it. And of course, from our experience also, there's a lot of technologies that came uh, during uh, the TNA assessment were grassroots technologies. So they basically emerged from people working on the ground. And sometimes it just needs an acknowledgement from the national process that this technology is important. So once you have that, uh, once you have that acknowledgement, then something that is probably in a pilot state can have a more, um, uh, you know, manufacturing version of a technology or something. And yes, and these are, and as far as research and development is concerned, I think the developing world has a lot to contribute in terms of knowledge sharing. And there is also importance of knowledge sharing in the, within the country as well, because you don't want to land up in a situation where there are, um, where the information flow is not efficient. So with this, I would like to sum up my, uh, presentation and I would say that I have like three key messages for the crowd here. That one is that please acknowledge that the climate is changing and we have serious health impacts because of the changing climate. And one way is to do is to involve technologies very actively um, in, in your planning, in developmental planning. And finally, um, through our technology needs assessment, we kind of do acknowledge that there are a lot of social considerations um, for technologies and these have to be kept in mind when designing policies. And of course, uh, when we are mainstreaming policies, it doesn't have to be just in the health sector, it has to be in a lot of other sectors. So that's about it and uh, since this presentation will be shared, you'll have my and Sarah's contact details and you can anytime get in touch with us if you'd like to know more about the center or about our work. So that's it, thank you. Good afternoon and thanks uh, for uh, 
the invitation. I'm very happy to be able to represent uh, the U European Office Environment and Health team today. But uh, the first part of the, of the presentation are more personal reflections. So, so <laughs> whatever is, is wrong here is my fault. <laughs> Um, and first of all, uh, when I got to the invitation, I was, I was very happy and very challenged because uh, having uh, you know, to present uh, uh, particularly with uh, Professor um, Ward Thompson, who is uh, working with us uh, in, the, um, in the area of uh, um, green space uh, and how this has uh, an impact on health, was posing an obvious challenge, first of, from an academic point of view, but second also in terms of what can we tell you to this audience uh, which is uh, not repeating or not uh, going into something that will be beautifully addressed by her. And also our colleagues in uh, climate change, this is one of the key areas of environment and health. So I thought, well, try, let, let's uh, try to have a look at uh, how we collectively over time have been developing uh, our understanding of the relationship th between environment and health. And let's uh, start, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm betrayed by my accent. You immediately can say that I'm an Italian. <coughs> and I come from Rome. And uh, this is what you see here. This looks like a nice monument, but actually it is a sewer. And it is uh, the sewage system that Rome, the Romans uh, built uh, 600 years uh, before Christ. And uh, those of you who in Europe uh, have been uh, growing up or living in cities uh, that uh, were founded and established uh, during the time of the Roman Empire, will know from the archaeology of your own cities that the Romans had the three fixations. One was uh, with the sewers, the second one was uh, with the running water. They, had, uh, they, they built uh, uh, aqueducts uh, throughout Europe. And the third one was uh, with the road infrastructure. It, it had the strategic uh, purposes at that time. But in a way, this kind of knowledge that uh, now the historians uh, tell us was uh, fundamental for the expansion and the growth of the, of the Roman Empire, as uh, well as uh, with the growth of Rome from a village of a few people to a city that uh, uh, at the top of the empire was more than one million of inhabitants, got uh, somewhat lost. And it uh, took, you know, more than 2,000 years <laughs> to go back and to understand that uh, if you live in a city, and uh, if you are not uh, providing for proper water and sanitation, then diseases will come up. This is not uh, something extraordinary new because we know that uh, um, plague has been a common feature, has been defining the history of the modern world, for example, throughout the, uh, the, the end of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. But what happened in London in uh, 1954 was that uh, um, this uh, um, John Snow, who we all uh, um, uh, worship as <laughs> the father of public health, uh, before, before Pasteur and Koch explained to us that microorganisms are responsible of infectious diseases, he made a very clever connection between um, the, the fact that the people who were um, an outbreak of cholera in one part of London was connected to the consumption of water that was uh, being picked up from a pump in the district. So by making that, uh, collection, uh, that, uh, that connection and by working with the local authorities and preventing people from keeping using the, the water from, from that pump, it was possible to stop that outbreak. That moment has started a beautiful unparalleled moment that is called by many as the sanitary revolution. It was the triumph of sanitary engineers. We have been building and strengthening sewage systems everywhere in Europe. They made it into the literature. How many of you have visited the, the, the sewers in, in, in Paris? And uh, the Le Miserable, one of the key masterpieces of the 19th century in the literature, He's staged part of it uh, into the, um, the, the sewers of Paris uh, that in those years uh, when were being rebuilt uh, and, uh, and expanded. But it doesn't uh, stop here. 
Those were the incredible years when we got the, 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 the steam uh, engine, where the, 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 the Suez Channel was cut, where the, the, the big inventions uh, took place. And this is, we are speaking about the cultures. What you see here are the billboards of a very, very famous ballet that uh, at the end of the 19th century was a huge success all around Europe. I urge you to go on, uh, on YouTube, you can find it. It is called the, the Excelsior Ball. And uh, I think it is extraordinary to see on stage the post girl with the telegram. And it is extraordinary to see us on stage in a ballet the explosion of the tunnel when they were cutting through the, the, Alp, the, the Alps to connect France and Italy through the Moncenisio. So there have been historical, iconic moments that uh, made us believing in progress. And this is perhaps uh, the most iconic moment uh, of that age. This is the Tour Eiffel is a monument to the capacity of the human being to tame nature and to, and to progress, uh, you know, its uh, verticality, iron, the beauty of, of, those, um, of, of many of those buildings. Just to think of the railway stations in many of our cities. They are cathedral to technology. They are, we were in love, we have been in love and we have been felt empowered. We can do this, this can give us progress. It made it even in the literature, the futurists, they tried to portray through images, through painting, and even in poetry, their fascination with, uh, with, uh, with the progress. This is a real poem. It is from 1912. It is part of the Manifesto of Futurist, and I can recite it for you. Zang, tum, 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 tu! People were trying to translate uh, the noise of technology, the noise of, of the city into poetry. It is fascinating, isn't it? But then we woke up. We woke up and we started understanding that uh, the environment and our interaction with the environment could also be a source of problems. Perhaps the London episode is again another milestone in the history of public health because it has been one of the first time where we have been uh, going out and trying to measure what was the effect of this. So in uh, uh, between uh, um, February, uh, December 1952 and February 1953, there was a, a high excess of deaths uh, in, uh, in London because people were exposed to an unusually high, they, they always had high pollution there, but this was unusually high for a, a for a combination of reasons. So we started understanding that air pollution is dangerous, and we tried to make uh, some, some connections to it. And then, uh, those of you who have been uh, teenagers uh, throughout uh, the 70s and, 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 and the 80s, uh, how many of you don't remember that we were, you know, horrified by the acid rains? So they were destroying the black forest in Germany. And this uh, collective concern, and this is important, prompted the political action. The big uh, environmental conventions uh, that were negotiated and people felt that we needed to do something. It is not uh, just my problem, it is not uh, just your problem. We have to come together. So the UNEC Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution that we still today trying to implement is the result of this uh, realization that the acid rains, which are caused by emissions of certain um, pollutants, were destroying uh, some of our natural resources. And then, 1976, we woke up one morning in the north of Europe, uh, in, the, in the north of Italy, with uh, a, a tragic uh, chemical accident. Uh, it was in Seveso, it's, it's a small town. There was uh, a massive release of chlorine from a chemical factory, and once again, we realized, my God, we can be exposed through the environment to powerful chemicals, and again, it was uh, this accident uh, that prompted the member states uh, to come together and negotiate uh, and prepare one of the pillars of the European Union um, um, uh, chemical uh, law, which is uh, the, Severo di the Seveso Directive. And uh, I believe those of you who were, who were at least uh, five years old 
uh, in uh, 26 April 1986 will remember where they were on those days. It was, again, a huge tragedy uh, which happened uh, with the, the Chernobyl accident. And it was another huge wake-up call at that time between the western part and the eastern part of the region. And all of a sudden we realized that there were no iron curtains that could stop the, uh, the, the radiation from moving from one place to another. And again, it has been a, a, a big wake-up call for us collectively, not the scientists, the normal people, those who were opening the newspaper and reading not to consume uh, salads for, for weeks, that the environment touches our life. Our colleague has just explained to us some of the big challenges that we have been learning about the climate change and health. And, uh, and again, um, I, I just want to, to, to raise the point that it is out of these uh, concerns and this uh, knowledge that once again, with the lots of difficulties, uh, the member states came together to negotiate the Framework of Convention on Climate Change. Now, why has been the attention to climate change important? It has been important because it has helped us to zoom out in our studies. We have stopped looking at the environment as the sum of, in a way, vertical problems, chemical safety, air pollution, water safety. No, we started to look at things from a much more higher perspective. And this is where we have landed. We, we realized that we understood that uh, the environment in terms of the complex of ecosystem is necessary to us and is necessary to, for our own survival. And this has been changing a lot. Again, it has been a step change, a leapfrog, if you wish, in the way we understand our relation uh, to, the, to the environment. And uh, it is from this uh, kind of studies uh, that, uh, um, and, and for example, the realization that uh, since uh, the, the, um, the Industrial Revolution, we have uh, uh, changed at an unprecedented pace the amount of consumption of natural resources, emissions into the environment, production of waste, that, that at some point is resulting now in uh, the environment uh, having lost uh, its own natural capacities uh, to buffer. The, the, any system has uh, some buffering capacity. It can accommodate uh, for changes into it, but up to a certain extent. If this uh, capacity is exceeded, then we do have uh, problems. And uh, we now know um, that um, uh, there, is a, there, are, there is a fascinating piece of research, uh, which is uh, underlying uh, now the, the sustainable development, the most recent uh, um, understanding of sustainable development, which uh, tells us that uh, perhaps uh, human activities have been already tampering beyond the, ca the capacity of the, of the environment to, to report on this uh, with some of these uh, systems, uh, climate change being one of those. So where we land now? These are the figures uh, from the latest uh, estimates of the European um, uh, the, of the global burden of, of uh, disease from the environment, recently released by the WHO, and basically they tell us that uh, one fourth, um, nearly, of global deaths are somehow linked to the environment. So again, it's a big call um, to uh, understand what these relationships are and how we can address them on which, uh, using which uh, policy levers. And then you see that uh, it is extremely important uh, the impact uh, that uh, the environment has on non-communicable diseases, which are at the top of the public health agenda. And uh, this is not uh, just about uh, new challenges that come, for example, from the new technologies, but it is also about uh, a remaining agenda from the, tem the time of John Snow, because in, if, if we look uh, at, uh, the glo at the world and we, lo uh, we look at Europe, we still see that we are challenged to provide everybody with the safe water, sanitation, and hygiene. And then uh, the last uh, point that, uh, again, uh, links me back to, uh, to the previous presentation is uh, there is also something positive here. We are also starting to, we are not only looking at the environment uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, 
as a, a potential source of health risks, but we are also looking at this in a positive way now. And all the, the exciting research that is taking place in uh, uh, green urban spaces or green space and health and well-being is, um, uh, is uh, of, of the greatest interest to us and to policymakers as well. And the same is uh, another example is active mobility. What is of interest in these areas is that uh, they can link up with other agenda and they can m multiply the benefits. So there are certain policies uh, that we may need uh, or consider to implement uh, for climate change reasons, like changing the way we travel in, uh, in cities towards less uh, uh, polluting uh, vehicles. They are at the same time good also for air quality and they can be great to make cities more livable and to make us uh, more physically active. So I'm about to close by um, introducing to you our team. The WHO works uh, on environment and health from Copenhagen and Bonn. Um, and we are within the division of policy, governance and health and well-being. Our uh, work is, uh, is grounded on the one side in the Health 2020, which is the European policy for health and well-being, and on the other on the um, sustainable development goals. We are trying to support the member states in developing uh, uh, national environmental policies that uh, bring in these in, um, uh, elements of international commitment to strengthen the capacity to understand and address these, uh, these issues. We have a lot of work to do in uh, um, normative areas. Uh, you might have heard about the WHO air quality guidelines. They are used by, for example, by the European Commission, uh, also with the, 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 the water quality uh, guidelines uh, to set their own uh, um, the EU uh, laws. And of course, uh, there is a, a host of collaboration with the UN family in implementing uh, several of those uh, instruments, uh, policy instruments uh, that I was presenting to you. We have been around for, more, for nearly 30 years and uh, um, we have been uh, working on teams uh, in uh, hand in hand uh, with, uh, with the member states. So it is the member states who decide on their, uh, based on their priorities what is the political agenda. And next year we will be in uh, holding our next ministerial conference uh, in the Czech Republic. And it is interesting to see that when we have a discussion with the member states about uh, which are the priorities that are emerging from their side, you see a lot of those uh, previous concerns uh, coming up, although with uh, some elements of novelty. Now there is a much greater attention, for example, to the urban dimension of issues because we understand how much uh, cities uh, are the places where health uh, can be created or destroyed. And uh, this is where we will be gathering there. I think it's fascinating because it is uh, um, Ostrava, the city of Ostrava, not only is, is in the center of Europe, but it was uh, one of the largest uh, um, industrial sites that, uh, that, that used to be there. It uh, was um, taken up during uh, the Second World War, annexed by the Third Reich because of its uh, capacity to produce iron. And it is a, a, a great example of how countries are now moving into the post, through the post-industrial transition and they are redeveloping uh, their economies, uh, moving, building on the legacy of the past and moving forward. So hope that uh, some of you will be with us uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Ostrava. And I'd like to, clo to close with this. Uh, this is a beautiful painting. It comes uh, from the city of Siena. Siena was an independent state uh, throughout the Middle Ages uh, and, and much of the Renaissance. And this painting is interesting, not just because it depicts uh, a beautiful city, but because of where it is. It is in the town hall of the city of Siena, and it was uh, in the room where the councillors and the, the, those who would uh, be ruling uh, Siena at that time would meet. And they asked uh, Ambrogio Lorenzetti to, to, to have two paintings. Uh, it, it, he has, uh, th this is the painting of the good governance. Uh, and I'm not showing to, that, to you that uh, because it would be depressing, but they also have the one of the bad governance <laughs> with, the, with the famine, with the war, with the plague, uh, all, it is all of there. 
And, um, and I think uh, that this is a very beautiful depiction that uh, they had to, to, to keep, they wanted to have in front of their eyes, to be reminded all the time of what uh, they should uh, stand for, the prosperity of their own city. Thank you very much. So thank you for three wonderful presentations. Do we have questions from the floor? Because we've got quite a lot of online interest, but perhaps we could start with some questions, comments from the floor. Well, while people are gathered, oh, Madam, please. Just a minute. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Mira. I'm from UN Women. And uh, I have a question to Ms. Ward Thompson. Um, and that was, how do we ensure a gender perspective in the planning of environment, uh, nature areas in urban areas? Yeah, due to, for instance, in some countries, there can be cultural or religious limitations for women that can limit their access to these areas and these kinds of public goods? Um, access, to, access to green and natural environments is clearly important for all, but it does need to be culturally sensitive. Um, and I think one of the challenges for us is, is now to move beyond perhaps showing through epidemiological studies and experimental studies that, that access to natural environment is important and good for us all, even if we are city dwellers, um, to look at um, culturally sensitive ways and appropriate ways of providing that access. Um, I think that we need an ecology of green space within a city, and some of that ecology can be part of the ecosystem services that are provided for uh, sustainable urban drainage, um, for green routeways that support active travel or make it pleasant to walk so that there can be, as, as Francesca has suggested, sort of multiple benefits from some of these green space areas. But we also need perhaps more private or local or small scale green spaces so that where people work or where people have small children, these can be accessed and they will be safe. They will be places that people feel confident to use. Um, and so uh, it's not, there's not sort of one size fits all. It's not just that a few big parks across the city will solve all of these problems. We need spaces we can get access to ideally every day. And they might be private or they might be semi-private or they might be little local neighborhood spaces as well as bigger and also wilder or more varied spaces that can allow for bigger activities, more natural environments and so on. So um, that's not an easy answer. But I think if we recognize the need for, for everybody, we know that people don't visit places very regularly unless they're within five to 10 minutes walk of home. That's just a fact, or from your work. If, you know, if you've got your lunch break, if you can't get to it within five to 10 minutes, you're not gonna go there very often, however much you think you ought to. And it's the same at home. So these places, th these environments, there needs to be something that is very close to where everyone lives. It may not offer a place to kick football around or everything that we want, but we need those as well as the bigger and more varied environments that offer a wider range of opportunity. Catherine, we, we have a question uh, on Slido, um, and which asks you what your main message to European policymakers about what they can learn from history would be. Is that sort of linked to what you Yes, I think it, it would link very much to that, that um, uh, as, as Francesca has beautifully shown, um, moving into urban environments has been very good for many populations' health and, and in social ways as well, many benefits, but one of the disbenefits can be a dissociation from the natural environment. And if we recognize that there are benefits, and there are, I didn't actually talk about all the different ways that it appears we benefit from the natural environment, including healthy development of the immune systems, it would appear is probably related to very early engagement with natural environment, microbiome development, all of those things. So um, if we recognize that it's good for our health, physically, mentally, psychologically, then policymakers need to see green infrastructure as 
important as a vital part of the city, just as educational infrastructure, transport infrastructure, all those other things are. Francesca, there's a question for you. Do you feel policymakers in Europe listen to WHO's advice on environment <laughs> and health? Well, <laughs> um, this is a challenging question. Um, I think uh, that uh, policymakers, uh, when they, uh, they have to, to make a decision, so they make decisions uh, not uh, just uh, on the basis of one argument. They make uh, decisions uh, on the basis of financial concerns, constraints, political expedience. Uh, so, but all in all, I have to say, uh, and I've been observing this uh, for the past uh, 20 years, <laughs> that uh, we do have, uh, uh, we do make an impact. Uh, people take, uh, for example, extremely seriously the, the, the guidelines. And uh, for example, the fact uh, that uh, uh, in the European, the European Union has been working with us very closely. We have been uh, participating in the ongoing uh, debate on that uh, and have been used uh, as a reference uh, um, the, if, if you take uh, the directive on uh, water quality, its annex uh, is, are the WHO guidelines. So in a way I can say yes, definitely, and, and very loudly because uh, these, uh, these directives have a direct impact on the millions, on hundreds of millions of people. And something that uh, perhaps we underestimate is how powerful, how strong are these uh, legally, legal instruments, uh, these uh, policy instruments because they, they can really make a difference uh, for millions and millions uh, of people. And this is why perhaps it is so difficult also to negotiate them, as uh, we have seen uh, with the, uh, the, the, the Paris Agreement. There was previous you know, meetings of the parties failed because it was impossible to find an agreement. So it means that the more it is difficult to negotiate, the more this is the, the indication that this stuff does really matter. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mbarka, and thank you for three very uh, interesting and important insights. Uh, I have a question for you, Dr. Naswa. Uh, you award a lot of time to the negative effects of uh, climate change, um, but what about the positive effects of climate change in relation to global health and technology? And I also have a question for you, Francesca. Um, uh, you talked a lot about the struggles in terms of implementing these environmental policies. Um, how can the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, be an effective uh, tool in this? Thank you. So I would say that, of course, there are positive effects of climate change as well. Like some of the places where it was probably too cold, you can have agriculture over there. But, you know, the magnitude of that is way less than the negative effects that it has and perhaps like in in the context of human settlements, in the context of urban spaces. It's like those, pop those places are probably not even much inhabited right now and we have like a significant population which is being affected by climate change and therefore we have to worry about them. Does that answer? That was it, right? On the sustainable development goals, uh, they are a major opportunity because what is going to happen is that they will shift and change the framework of accountability. There is something for each and every one in, in the sustainable development goals. And the moment when the energy sector has to start to report according to certain indicators about the progress achieved in a certain area, it means uh, that they will have to take uh, responsibility for that. It means uh, that uh, they will have to, um, to in, a way, in a way, to make the SDGs part of the way they, they, they are going to be judged. Their performance uh, will be assessed and evaluated. So I think uh, that the, the SDGs, apart from their you know, universal applicability, the, the, the fact that they are a they underpin a beautiful vision of, of, the, of, of the future, but they are really pushing every sector to, to become more accountable and more responsible because of this uh, framework of, of, uh, of accountability. And that will be a, a major push forward, I believe. Yeah. 
Anna Stein from WHL. Thank you very much. This was an amazing panel, and I learned so many new things. I've been in public health now for almost 30 years, but this has been a revelation. I have a question for Professor Wood Thompson. You mentioned the uh, correlation between hydrocortisol levels and access to green spaces. Uh, obviously, hydrocortisol being um, uh, a marker of stress. Um, what does this correlate to when you compare it to other interventions, for example? Is there any research that shows that access to green spaces, spaces is as effective as another de-stressor? And what order of magnitude does that exist in? Great question. I wish I could give the answer. <laughs> um, the simple answer is that, that, that we don't yet know, but these are exactly the kind of things that we want to be looking at. We, we are doing some research at the moment looking at perceived stress, so not using a, a cortisol measure, not using a biomarker, but perceived stress, um, and enhancing deprived urban populations' access to local woodlands by physically improving the environment and encouraging social engagement. And we are seeing a small effect there. And one of the challenges is, is to understand the, um, the characteristics of that effect and how much that might relate to other kinds of interventions. So the honest answer is, I'm not sure. But I think this is the kind of thing that we need to be developing next. And we, we have, in our latest research, involved a health economist to try and start to unpack some of exactly that kind of question. <laughs> I mean, there is this very interesting question uh, that says in the 70s and 80s, the ozone hole was a huge environmental concern. International action means that the threat is now abating. What can we learn from there? Is that a model? Yeah, yeah well, I think uh, that uh, this, this, uh, the example of the ozone uh, um, and, and, and the fight that there has been uh, to reducing emissions uh, of, uh, of precursors of, of ozone is a positive story, is a good story. And it shows that uh, uh, treaties, they can be very effective uh, tools to address uh, uh, common areas of, con of concern. So I think uh, there is a lot uh, positive that can be learned from that and uh, we can uh, capitalize and leverage on the other instruments uh, which, which are out there. Okay, and just to add to what Francisca just said, that of course uh, we have to look at the positives, but frankly we have not still done enough, and um, there is still a long way to go to even achieve the two degrees emissions target. So there's, there's a long way to go. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think um, I've had a chance to <laughs> respond. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank for a fantastic panel. I uh, learned a lot. So thank you for joining us today, and thank you all for joining us as well. And uh, the next GHS seminar, seminar, the 100th one, is going to be held in Rio at Rio Cruz on Zika. And mm. it's going to be broadcast live like this in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. So please do join us online. We'll make sure to share the links and the posters with our colleagues in Copenhagen. Copenhagen. So thank you all. Thank you all the colleagues, all the food and all the help and the hospitality generally. Thank you very much. <laughs>